Today, we're meeting with a pioneer in the world of everyday carry accessories. It's Emerson Knives. Stick around. Thanks for joining us today on Shoot of the Series. I'm Ed Thorell from Firearms Education and Training, and today's a very special day. We're here at Emerson Knives. And we're here to meet Ernie Emerson, who's a legend in the industry. He's been inducted in the Martial Arts Hall of Fame with Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. Um, he was the innovator of the Emerson knife with the Wave, which most of you might be familiar with. And if you're not, stick around because we're going to get acquainted. So anyway, um, they've been nice enough to invite us into their shop. And uh, anyway, this is Ernie. Ed, how are you doing? Thank you for coming pleasure by. Pleasure to meet you. It's an honor. Excellent. My pleasure. Welcome to my uh, my man cave, I guess, for lack of a better term. This I like it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what we do is I would like to talk to you a little bit about, you know, the background of your knife, you know, where things came from, and kind of tell us in your own words um, how you kind of got from there to here, because I think there's a real good story there. Um, we do a lot with um, getting people prepped for concealed carry mm -hmm. and everyday carry. And um, my belief is if you're going to go to a gunfight, you better take an Emerson with you. <laughs> so anyway, um, why don't you just in your own words, just tell us a little bit about what you got going on here and okay. how you went from there to here. All right. Well, come on in. Have a seat. Please. Absolutely. I'm going to sit down. And... My story uh, is, it's nothing special, of course, it's just I ended up here, you know, by, some by chance, some by design, some by just pure luck, so, but I was born in northern Wisconsin and uh, was raised, I was actually born and raised in a log cabin uh, built by my grandfather for my folks uh, for their wedding gift, uh, it cost $42 to build the, the house. So it was a little meager. It was 20 by 30, and I actually slept on a little spool bed in the kitchen, actually, because there was not enough room for... I have a brother and a sister, and <clears> there <throat> wasn't quite enough room for all of us in any of the bedrooms. So it, it started out as pretty humble, but I think one of the things that I believe was a starting point for me being here was to come from an environment where you had to learn to do pretty much everything you did uh, yourself, uh, you know, whether it was <laughs> plumbing or mechanics or, you know, I worked on the farm. I came from a farming community and uh, all of my aunts, uncles, grandfathers and everybody else were farmers. So I worked on the farms uh, since I was old enough to drive a tractor, which was about 10 years old because that's, it, and that's a typical story. It's nothing special to me, but that's about the, when you get to be about 10 is about when your feet can actually reach the, uh, uh, the clutch. <laughs> and hold on to the string wheel. So you autom automatically became a tractor driver uh, for baling hay or spreading manure or, or, or disc in the field. So, uh, but because of being in that type of environment, if something broke, you had to fix it. There was no, you couldn't call Bob the plumber or Bob the, you know, guy to weld up the disc on a, on a disker if it broke or combine went bad or whatever. So you learn how to weld and you learn how to hammer and you learn how to saw and you learn how to do all of that good stuff. So that's kind of, I believe, a major part of why I enjoy so much what I do. And one of the things that someone told me, and, and I, I got to be honest with you, I, I consider myself probably one of the luckiest people uh, on the planet Earth. And the, and the reason for that is you know, how many people have a job that is something they do for free if, if they didn't get paid for it? And, and that's what I have. And, and it's funny because guys have said, Ernie, when are you going to retire? And I, I tell them, look, I, I've, I've been retired for only 30 years. Because, <laughs> you know, I'd be doing this no matter what. But, uh, you know, to, to get back on track with the, how did I get to knife making is, is I think, where you actually wanted me to kind of, lucid a little bit. Um, I was a young boy and I was uh, an athlete, etc. Played all the sports in high school and everything. And there was a TV show called Kung Fu with David Carradine. And I 
was knocked off my feet, the, you know, Shaolin monks and, you know, the throwing stars and all of that good stuff. And then, uh, but being in northern Wisconsin, uh, there's no martial arts schools. And I mean, little tiny town, they called us Jack Pine Savages is, is what our nickname was. So it's, it's I like it. far removed. Yeah, <laughs> I wear it proudly. <laughs> my wife doesn't like it all that much, but <laughs> I'm a damn Jack Pine Savage through and through. Sounds like a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That'd be a good name yeah, for a bottle. I'll, I'll buy the first bottle for the okay. second one. There you go. <laughs> so anyway, having that interest in the martial arts, um, you know, there wasn't any way for me to really train except uh, Black Belt Magazine and some of those things, a bunch of martial arts books that I could buy uh, via the mail. And then um, I saw my first Bruce Lee movie. And that changed everything. And at that point, uh, you know, I started trying to read or learn or, or, you know, I think I saw Enter the Dragon probably 17 times, actually. And uh, anyway, you know, it wasn't so much that I was a big fan or enamored with Bruce, but I was, I was a student of fighting, and that was what he taught. He didn't teach uh, things that were unnecessary. Um, he only taught or only did what would be necessary at that moment in time for any physical confrontation. And for me, that resonated coming from a practical, you know, Come from a rural background, yeah, everything's about the practical. It has to work, yeah. And otherwise, it's just a waste of time. Yeah. And so anyway, uh, what could I do? What could I do? You know, in order to learn what Bruce Lee had taught, there was one school in the United States, and it was in Los Angeles, California. And it was taught by two gentlemen, uh, a guy named Dan Inosanto and Richard Bastillo. Yeah. And... I moved, I was in college, I went to school and got my degree and all that good stuff, but it, I knew I had to come out here to train uh, because I, I, I was on the university karate teams and studied this and that, wherever, I was like a pickup guy, wherever there was a game going on, you know, I'd get in the game. But it was just a mismatch of all kinds of stuff. And so, but I knew I had to come out here to Los Angeles and I did. I picked up and moved from uh, Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin and uh, came out here and uh, found out that you couldn't just go over to the school and say, hey, I want to come in here and, and train. Uh, you had to wait. There was a, I waited six months before they would allow me to actually become a student at the school when they started in a new phase one, they called it. But what happened was it was a reality check for uh, practicality. In other words, what Bruce and or did, Bruce had passed away uh, so Dan and Richard were carrying on the torch because they were his, his basically his, two of his senior students and the guys that he had given the mantle to, to to teach his martial art called Jeet Kune Do. So anyway, what happened was we would go to the school, or I was at the school, and on Saturdays he would bring in the wrestling coach from UCLA or the uh, a pro boxer from the Sugar Ray Leonard uh, camp or whatever. So it was really a, a, a an amalgam of all of this different stuff that it was like, wow, we're getting exposed to this and that and kung fu and karate and all of this good stuff because it was his, the goal of Bruce was, you know, choose whatever works for you and discard the rest because each individual, and I'm sure you experience this sometimes in the shooting world because uh, although there are parameters that you need to force people to understand the basics and the principles, uh, there's still certain nuances. Some students are just not quite as as good at certain things. And you so, have to accommodate. Yeah, and that's 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 an important thing too because you can't cookie cutter no. uh, people out. It just doesn't. You can get results, but they're not the in the end what you're after. And I'm sure you feel this because you you had mentioned to me uh, when we talked earlier that you were a teacher. Well, what's the goal of a teacher? That the the goal of a teacher is is really not to. Uh, have you so much learn the things that I want you to know, it's to engage you to learn the things that you want to know. I'm giving you the, the core stuff, but I want you to be a student. And that when I say student, I mean you leave my history class and you go out and buy books about the things that we talked about and go on your own journey. And go out and get turned on. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that to me is what, what makes a superior teacher. And, you know, I think you've had it 
as so many people had, there was, there was always those one or two teachers in your lifetime that you're like, oh, God, yeah, that was the greatest. That guy set me on the path. I had a couple of those, but where I'm going with this is I actually had that with Dan and Asano and Richard Basillo. Those guys were so, they were like that. We don't want you to cookie cutter out and out the door you go and you've got your black belt or whatever it would be. We want you to be someone who develops the ultimate uh, set of skills that fit you. Because it's going to be, especially in the physical aspects like uh, uh, wrestling, judo, boxing, kung fu, all of those things, certain people are more adept or they just fall into a, a better uh, set of physical skills that fit that part of the puzzle better. And that's what they did. So where am I going with this? What's martial arts got to do with any of this? It all comes back to the knife making because what happened was... While I was there, uh, because Richard and Dan were Filipino, they had butterfly knives. And part of what we were doing was edge weapons training. What knife did they have? It was the butterfly knife, the Bally Song. And so I was a starving student. The, the dues there were $12.50 a month. And there were times when I couldn't even, I couldn't pay the twelve fifty, And I'd go to Dan or Richard and say, I, you know what, I can't pay the dues. Uh, you know, what can I do? And it's like, oh, I'll clean the bathrooms up, you know, wipe down the floor, you know, arrange the furniture or whatever, and uh, we'll call it good. So I had no money, basically. So the knives that they had, and the, and the only place you could really get butterfly knives in the United States at, at that time was a company called uh, Pacific Cutlery. Pacific Cutlery was the precursor company to Benchmade. Oh, there's a long, circuitous story we're going to get to in a second. So their knives, the, ben, the uh, Pacific Cutlery knives, they were like $100 plus dollars a piece. And it's like, well, it might, have been, might as well have been a Rolex or a, or a Rolls Royce to me because there's no way on earth I could do it. But I, I thought, wow, I can, I can drill and hacksaw and, and uh, you know, file things into shapes. Uh, so I said, well, maybe I could make a couple of those knives or make myself one, or a crude, you know. It wasn't that I wanted to be a knife maker. I wanted one of those damn butterfly knives because they were so awesome, right? So I went to Richard, who became a really close personal friend of mine, and unfortunately he, he passed away last year, which is a, a, a loss for me personally, but a loss to the, to the world of martial arts uh, that I don't think will be filled for a long, long time. But anyway, I went to Richard and I said, uh, Sifu, could I borrow your knife to copy and try and make one? And he said, yeah, go right ahead. So he gave me the knife on a Friday. And uh, over the weekend, I had gotten some aluminum and some steel and a hacksaw and everything. And filed it out, drilled it, pounded pins into it, and, and brought it back on uh, Monday night and uh, gave him his knife back. And he said, well, let me see what you have. And so he said, well, and he flipped it around. It actually kind of kind of worked. And he said, it's, it's not great, but it's pretty good. He goes, I think you could probably use this. And I was like, oh, man, that's cool. Here's a guy who's one of Bruce Lee's students telling me I did something good. And I was like, holy crap, man. I was you like, didn't suck. Oh, yeah. my God. But what I found out also was there were a lot of other starving students who couldn't afford those hundred-plus dollar knives. And so immediately it was like, Ernie, do you think you, you could make me one? And I was like, oh, that was kind of cool. That, that feels good, too. You know, somebody else wants something I can make. Uh, sure, just, you know, you have to pay for the aluminum and the piece of steel and all that, but I'll, I'll make you a knife. So made a knife, made another knife, made another knife. Uh, that started my knife-making career. So where do the martial arts have to do with my knife-making? It was because I couldn't afford to buy one of those Pacific Cutlery Ballet songs because I was being exposed to them in that in the school it was called the Filipino Cali Academy over on Normandy and in, in, uh, in uh, Torrance, California and that led me to my knife making career now here's a cool thing I have that knife <laughs> this is the original Emerson uh, Ballet song knife and that was done without a grinder it was done with a file uh, so I filed it. I heat treated it with a uh, butane torch. Uh, it's 01 tool steel. It's a piece of aluminum that I, I routed out with a uh, basically a 
uh, like an end mill stuck in a uh, uh, drill press because I didn't have a milling machine or anything and hand filed and cut everything out and uh, that is the original first ever Emerson knife and uh, I still have it and uh, one of my kids will end up with it at some point but this is the one that, that started me on, wow. my, on my path. And uh, that's pretty amazing because you know the the Chinese character for danger is both crisis and opportunity, mm. and being pushed to do that, you know, hey, can't pay the rent, but hey, I can do this out of something that causes stress, using yeah. stress as fuel. Well, you know, one of the things that I've always thought as a um, well, it's it's evident when you when you train. Uh, the only way that you can improve is to in induce stress. Now, whether that's weight training or physical, you know, combat or, or I, I mean, think about it. Once you have gotten a student to the point where they can manipulate a weapon, they know how to use it in a safe manner, they can actually put their rounds somewhere near the target that you, you want to hit, what is the next step that you have to introduce to them? Time and stress. Absolutely. Because to push that envelope and get them yeah. out of their comfort zone so they can learn. That is the only way that they can progress at that point. I, uh, I'll, I'll make just the short version of where I was going to how I got here. So Pacific Cutlery became Benchmade Knives. I was uh, at the Kelly Academy doing the knife stuff and everything. Went off kind of on my own, but my wife and I decided to go to the Pomona Gun Show, which at that time, this was back in the 80s, Big. It was six miles of aisles. You, you wear that. yourself out. Walked into this one uh, uh, building. It was the knife makers section. And there was about 20 guys there sitting at these long tables. Did they roll out the red carpet for you? The, no one rolled out anything <laughs> for me, believe me, because I was just an average Joe, you know. And I walked in, and I was like, what is this? And it was a bunch of guys that had handmade knives. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. What in the hell is a handmade knife? You know, even though I did this, I didn't consider myself a knife maker. I just was a guy who you were making a tool. knew how to put something together. Yeah. And so I was like, are you kidding me? And it was a guy named Mel Pardue who became a good friend of mine over the years. A real, real nice guy. And outstanding knife maker. And I said, not knowing him, but being introduced to him at the time, I said, do you mean you actually make a living by making knives? And he goes, yes, I do. I said, well, what's your other job? And he goes, I... I don't have another job. I make knives and sell them. And I was like, I have to do this. I have to do this. Yeah. And so we went and bought a, a book. It was a book by Sid Latham. It was called Knives and Knife Makers. It was the only book that existed at that time that had anything. But it was a, it was a, there was about 30 knife makers in there from all over the U.S. because there wasn't a big community at that time. Took it home and I was like, oh my God, I got to make these knives. I got to make these knives. So I have here today really... I made a couple of these, but my real second knife that I made, I made for my dad. Because being from northern Wisconsin, uh, he was a hunter, fisherman, actually kind of a guru and all that. You know, it's, it's funny when you're a kid, you see your parents as your parents, and it's not the way other people see them. I, I finally realized when I was about a senior, maybe a little bit older in high school, when my friends kept saying, Ernie, do you think your dad would take me trout fishing with him? because I, I really would like to go fishing with him. And I'm going, some other guy wants, some other of my friends wants to go fish with my dad. Like, what? You know, what's that all about? And then I realized when I got older uh, that he was regarded in that, he was one of those guys who was a tremendous outdoorsman, tremendous outdoorsman, and knew this and knew that and knew all the secret spots. And so anyway, blah, blah, blah. I made a knife for my dad. I have it here. He, my dad passed away two, three years ago, and he gave it back to me before he passed away. But this is, and this is a super secret because I just never, ever get the chance to show people. This is actually the second knife that I ever made, really. Uh, and it, uh, I made it for my dad. It was a little hunting knife. He never used it. He never used it because... It was special. It was too precious to take yeah. out in the woods, yeah. And again, this is a knife that I made uh, strictly by hand with a, a rat tail files, and uh, I soldered on the guards, made uh, washers. Uh, this is some kind of maybe walnut or something. I can't even remember. But again, hand filed with a uh, just a mill file, and then heat treated in a uh, with a um, 
a butane torch. So uh, that's the knife that I made for my dad. Which, wow. You know. So anyway, I don't think I've even really ever showed that uh, to anybody. So you guys got a chance to see it. I just remembered it when I have it here at work in my safe. And uh, it's very cool to be able to bring that out. And, you know, I hope, I hope some people are interested in that kind of stuff. We really want to thank Ernie Emerson and the good folks at Emerson Knives for letting us spend so much time. Uh, we're going to be breaking up this interview into several different parts because there was just so much. We can't get it all into one. Uh, we want to thank Ernie for really letting us into his private world, showing us the first knives he's made, especially the knife that he made for his father. That was really cool. Nobody's seen this before, so you guys are getting a first look. Next time we're out, we're going to be looking at the innovations that made Emerson Knives a game changer within the industry. So stick around for that. We'd like to thank our subscribers. Uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. And on behalf of Shoot of the Series, I'm Ed Thorell from Firearms Education and Training. Y'all take care.